were so blessed to work with a very talented production designer on this movie. Quentin met with Michael a couple times and Michael was so excited. I mean, I kept getting emails from him being like, I would love to do this movie. He was so passionate about this film. He'd say, honey, this is gonna be the best credit you've ever had on your resume. He said, this is gonna be the greatest film we've ever done. Well, when I first read the script, I loved it. I mean, I was, I, I couldn't put it down. You in the saloon. We got a hundred rifles aimed at every way out of that building. It was a combination of every spaghetti western that I've loved, I grew up with, plus a very serious subject about slavery, which is always tough to deal with and very taboo. And But he handled it in his usual kind of serious light, serious light kind of fashion. That's really good. So I decided I got to do it. Michael really saw Django's journey, but more in a geographical way, and he was able to really visualize that. The important thing about this movie for me and what we first settled on in the very beginning was that authenticity is important, you know, respect of the period, but authenticity should never be something that stands in the way of a good storytelling. So the movie has a bit of a lyricism to it. There's a fine line between doing reality and riding on that edge of the spaghetti western. We took detail away. We didn't put as many outbuildings. We didn't put as many trees in. We didn't want to distract away from the performance. Michael, just a man so comfortable with such a huge task. Sit down, my boy. He transported us back all those years, and it looked exactly the way it needed to look. Everything down to detail was amazing. The first time I ever met that man was on Congo. A friend of mine said, come on, it's the easiest job we have. It's all Reeve, it's all art direction. I said, okay. So I go over there and I see this man and he's planting these little plants in front of this like African hut. And I said, hi, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to help you. He says, okay, yeah, get on your hands and knees here, honey, and, and, and just start digging, just start digging. We'll start putting holes and we'll just put these plants in here. I said, okay. So I get on my hands and knees and I start talking to him. And I, I said, my name's Hope Parrish, what's your name? He goes, I'm Michael Riva. I said, oh my God, you're the production designer. Riva has done amazing work across so many categories. He's not just building sets, he's getting involved with props, he's personally finding the locations. He's just everywhere on the film. Going on location scouts with Michael is the best time of your life. I mean, we find incredible things, but it is one of the most rewarding and fun times. We would have two scout vans and the boys would always be in one and we were in another one and they'd all just get out and laugh. And it was a real boys club, but in a, in a really great way. We found a great little town north of Los Angeles and it was beautiful. We fixed it up, we added things, we added gallows, we redid the saloon inside. You fill it up with people and horses and carriages and mud in the streets, which Quentin and I both wanted lots of mud. Then Bob Richardson, I think, did a spectacular job of lighting it. It was all kind of very smoky and dark, and we had smoke all the time. And the smoke just hung there in the street, so it was perfect. It was ideal. At one point in the film, we were going to build Greenville at Melody Ranch and give the entire place a facelift. Then as Quentin really developed what Greenville was, we started looking at open lots around New Orleans, you know, the industrial areas and so forth to build, you know, the slave auction and the streets. And by the time it got uh, the, that Quentin had gotten um, what he really wanted for the film, we realized, Michael and I went out on the side of the studio and went, we can build it here. With all the slaves going through there and walking in the mud and we had the snow candle ash coming down. And it was just, it was beautiful. I'm Dr. King Schultz. This is my horse, Fritz. What kind of doctor? Dentist. Quentin decided that he wanted to have one as so a dentist, a dental wagon. And so uh, I showed him some pictures of, you know, wagons of the time, boxes basically with wheels. And we picked one that we really liked, a real kind of wood slatty, very run down. It's not a very professional looking play thing. It's not all black and slick. It's kind of thrown together. And then Quentin had this idea. He says, you know, I want a tooth sitting on the top. And I want it to kind of wobble, like a bobblehead. I said, okay. What's everybody staring at? And then uh, Quentin asked me, he said, I want you to take the tooth and uh, he's got to put a place to put his money. So he said, what do you think if we put it in the tooth somewhere? I said, well, let's just cut a little hole like a wall safe. He said, yeah, 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 let's do that. Of course, the tooth got damaged all the time because it wobbled about like this and it hit trees. So we've made maybe 20 of those teeth and had to repair them. But 
And then I put a filling on the top, a gold filling on the top. So it just it became a very hilarious little bit. Every time you look at it, you laugh. Dr. Schultz, good to see you again. Colors are important to me. They're mood establishers. And I really clearly saw Leo's character as the devil. So I wanted to surround him with as much red as possible. Hard cake. I don't go in for sweets, thank you. I loved the color that Michael Riva painted the study, that deep, deep burgundy red. In Quentin's mind, he saw two big red leather Chesterfield wing chairs. And I thought it was quite beautiful when it, when it was done. Post. For Django and Schultz, it seemed to me that they were Western heroes. They were the warm nicotines and the ambers and those kind of colors. So I tried to keep those colors in each set. And as the movie went along, I tried to bang into those colors a couple of times, contrast and stuff. And at the end of the movie, things get darker, things get redder, things get more serious, blood is red. So for me, it helped to separate the two worlds that come clashing together. I love the contrast. Here's this pristine, gorgeous, monumental piece of architecture. And then at the end, the contrast of the blood all over the walls, the bullet holes, you know, the bodies everywhere was fantastic. It is an absurd period. He gets it. He gets the decadence and how perverted this world really is. Well, I part company from many of my phrenologist colleagues mm. is I believe there is a level above Bright. At the party, Calvin Candy's talking about the supremacy of white men over black men, and you get this really eerie, horrible feeling. So Quentin and I kind of talked about, and we were right on the same track about this, about now you're getting in a carriage and you're going to this guy's house. What you're set up for and ready to feel is this horrible looking place that's deep and dark under shadows and stuff and where really bad stuff could happen. They're going further and further into hell. And rather than that, we decided to go the other way, which was to, what a surprise. It's like Disneyland. It's very, very pretty, you know, it's very it's inviting and very welcoming. You know, big flat area, a little bit uh, Wyeth-y, you know, like Days of Heaven, you know, very simple, clean, not foreboding at all. And I think we achieved that by just having it centered in the middle there. And we let, let the bad stuff happen inside. You stay right here. The interior flowed straight out of Michael's head and Quentin's. For instance, in his initial writing, Quentin saw the dining room as being upstairs because he wanted a particular shot up and down the stairs. So unlike most reality, we put the dining room upstairs. So sometimes you had to sort of tweak reality. A plantation in Mississippi at that time would not have had gas lighting. There was no municipal gas lines to something like that. You could have had what were called oil burning lights or candles. And we had to figure out how to, to get that across. You want to do things for real. You don't want to burn the set down. <laughs> hey, little troublemaker. You want to see the flicker and put it where it will be seen. And we had to figure out what was where and how we were going to use it. Evergreen was just beautiful. It set back from the street. It had these two spectacular stairways, stairwells coming down that were fantastic. And uh, I liked that. I thought they were great. We actually went into the field across and went up on the jetty and said, this is the perfect long entryway. It gives the DP, Bob Richardson, a lot of different variables and different angles that he can shoot it. That whole entire area since the 1700s was sugarcane, no cotton. We got together with different greensmen and said, what can we grow in a specific amount of time that will resemble cotton? And it came up with several different types of plant, but it was fava beans, and that kind of worked. It's a very good facsimile for cotton with the cotton balls on top, which we did put in. And there were about 395,000 of them that we made and put on the plants. And then they had this big piece of property in the back that we took over and bulldozed and created two acres of grass and built our other mansion, which is a little different. 
and it had this road that goes for almost four miles. It's just a straight road right to the front door, and I thought that was very effective and dramatic. It was perfect. It was like our own back lot. Rodney, take it, Charlie. Y'all get your ass over by that pin. Come on, Charlie. Come on out. The life around that plantation it was a horror, but the irony is you're surrounded by beauty. You're surrounded by, you know, sunsets, sunrises. It was spectacular. Beautiful. Uh, I remember the day when Michael passed away and everybody was on the set. You know, it became different. It became, you know, let's back up a little bit and just really realize how blessed and charmed we are. He was so passionate about this film. He loved everything about this film. He just kept seeing more and more and more. And that was what was the beauty about him. He loved his crew. He loved his family. He loved his work. And his work on the film is staggering. He finished designing every frame of the film before he passed away. Those sets in Candyland and Bennett Manor and all those places now looks great. He, he did his job. Michael was fantastic. He was such a lovely collaborator and I just treasured him for that. In a lot of ways, I trusted him like I trust my father. We were his other family. When he did pass, it was like, oh my God, how do we go on? How do we do? And that night, we all made a pact. We're going to make this. We're going to do the best. We're going to do it intuitively the way he would want us to do it and show Quentin everything that Michael would have wanted us to show him and keep that same 125% mark up because that's what he'd want us to do. The day after he passed away, everybody was in the office, and they said, what would Michael want? Would he want to have a day of you know, mourning for him? Shut down the crew. And I kind of smiled at that, kind of bittersweet. And I said, if it was me that went, he knows how I would feel. And I know he shares the same thing. And I said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And that's what we did. The last time I saw him, he was setting up for Greenville, which had come and gone, and we're shooting it, and we're not shooting it. And he was really great at rolling with the punches. He put his arm around me and he's like, now look at this. And he just showed me all of Greenville. And he goes, and I'm gonna put a shack over there. And he was just like a kid in a candy store, a man in his garden. He was a really lovely, lovely man.